Hi, followers of the way. Um, I'm glad to be with you on this Monday morning. This is July the 20th. And we're into the last third of July now by anybody's standard, which means we are by anyone's standard past the halfway point in the middle of summer. And um, that seems uh, worthy of note to me. Uh, and also, we're saying welcome to any who are gathering us for with this Bible study. I'm here joined by the Reverend Peacock, the Reverend Will Wellman, the Reverend Ken Hubble, who's been dreaming overnight, sharing some of his dreams with us, and the uh, Reverend Nicole Abnor. Thank you, colleagues. This is unusual. There aren't a lot of places where you'll find the pastors associated with the congregation gathering on Monday morning uh, to look at the scripture for the Sunday coming ahead and sharing it like this uh, online. So I am grateful for the chance to begin the week with you all. We'll post this a little afternoon, and we are especially glad to have with us those who may be um, visiting, those who may be uh, signing in for the first time. We try to post this every week, and we particularly appreciate your comments, whether you email those to us, or, uh, uh, and you can send them to me at john at and I'll forward them to the others, or you can look on our webpage and get their email addresses, or whether you post them in the uh, portals and comment sections underneath the social media spots where you see this coming up. That dialogue is helpful to us. It's not only encouraging, but stretches us, and we tolerate disagreement pretty well. Uh, and uh, uh, we are grateful for the places where your observations and um, comments uh, come in to be a part of the narrative and Bible study as well. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for thinking about the Bible with us. Thank you for commenting and sharing with us uh, on it. One of the things we do before we read the Bible is to pray. And the followers of the way have been meeting for over 25 years on Mondays and have consistently opened and closed with prayer uh, in this hour of Bible study. And we are grateful to be able to be a part of that tradition in the world as well. So um, I'm going to ask my colleague who agreed to open in prayer to go ahead and pray us in. Good and gracious God, as we examine your scripture, we know that you examine our hearts. Bring clarity to us as we are transformed by our readings. Help us discern what you might be teaching us in this moment and bless our conversations. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. And then um, Will Wellman, ever helpful, has got the lectionary text to put up and share with you all. And you can find this text yourself, friends, if you want to pull it up. Um, uh, you can find uh, this text uh, uh, listed as a lectionary text a number of different places. Um, uh, the Vanderbilt lectionary pages or at textweek.com. This is the lectionary gospel reading for um, the last Sunday in July. And you can see it splits, um, it drops out uh, a section in the middle, and that's the passage that we looked at last Sunday. And now we're uh, picking up um, the passage that was immediately prior to that and coupling it with the uh, passage that we just left. The passage for last Sunday was a little bit more of an extended parable and included Jesus than commentary on it when the disciples came to him and asked him to explain it to them. And so now the lectionary scholars are putting together smaller parables, several of them just a verse each, and, and weaving them together and bringing them uh, to us. We are continuing in this middle part of Matthew's gospel as Jesus walks along uh, Galilee teaching to hear his teaching, and he's particularly preaching with parables. And so this summer we have been looking at one parable after another. And that continues to be the case today. So I wonder, I think uh, Mike said he would read it, right, Mike? And so if you'll go ahead and read the text for us. Mike, you're muted. Well, I clicked it. Let me try again. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, 
but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. That in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they draw it ashore sat down and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his, his treasure, what is new and what is old. The word of the this Lord. Is the word of the Lord. Thanks to God. Um, let me start uh, moderating by being a bit Socratic uh, and asking some uh, obvious questions to which I'm hoping my colleagues will lift up obvious answers, not a test, but just to lay this out for the followers. And folks, I really think this Bible study especially is helped if you actually have the text in front of you. So you might want to pause it and get your Bible if you don't already and turn to this 13th chapter of the Gospel of um, Matthew here. And um, last week, we talked about why the mustard seed was dropped out. And we, we couldn't find it. I mean, I speculated incorrectly that um, the lectionary scholars left it out in the study of Matthew because they came to it in, in Mark's gospel later. And so as not to duplicate the precious uh, pericopes that they had to work with. But um, I was wrong. And even in my uh, trying to look and research it, I, I was wrong. It's right here. <laughs> in the text that we saw uh, last week, but they obviously, um, it's in the middle between the parable about the uh, seeds, the wheat planted uh, with the weeds, and then Jesus' interpretation of that parable. That's where the little mustard seed um, uh, uh, is found. So now this week, they pick it up, and they put these little parables together. That is, here's the first Socratic question. That's what they're giving us, right? A collection of little parables, right? Do you all think that's what's going on? They're, they've, they've taken these little parables, meaning they're, they're expressed in few verses, and strung them together. Right? This is not a trick right. question. <laughs> right. Correct. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> yeah, good. Thank you. So I want the followers to see that's what's going on. They, they're now they're saying this Sunday deal with all the little parables, <laughs> okay? And so um, that begs the question: Should they be strung together? You know, is the fact that they're just a verse sufficient rationale for lumping them all together? They also come right here all in the same chapter. But um, I, I then revisit uh, the question, and I'll take a shot at it and see if you all want to critique it. It's a good time to say, what is a parable? Note that the text begin, begins with Jesus saying, he put before them another parable. And that language is used several places in Matthew. I'm really drawn to that line. He put before them the parable. He placed it before them as if the parable itself engages them. He, you know, as if he could just put it out there and then they have to spend the rest of the time looking at it, reading it, thinking about it, interacting with it. He put it before them as if, as if it's an animate thing that he places it before them. And, uh, and there's truth in that because the parable is a teaching tool and it's um, often an enigma that um, brings surprise as a part of it to um, the reader. But in this case, 
I don't think the effective or therapeutic or interpretive power of the parable is so much the surprise as it is analogy. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like these little stories. Um, and, and so it looks to me like that's another thing that connects these little stories. They, they aren't surprising stories, for, uh, especially, you all may disagree with that, but it, they don't have like the, the parable of the 99 and the one, uh, you know, exactly the same surprise, um, or do they? But that's, what's, what's, what is it that makes, uh, uh, let me stop there before we go to the content of the parables themselves, just to revisit, what is it that makes the parable a parable sufficient to be something that can place before people and powerful in and of itself as a part of speech? Well, John, I mean, I think that it's a, a parable in part, as you're saying, that is the introduction the kingdom of heaven is like, which is part of the formula that we receive and Jesus often uses uh, as he enters into the telling of parables. Um, and here's a section, and I'm, I'm resisting getting into the content, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> he uses that little phrase every time. Uh, here right. in this chapter, verse twenty, verse twenty-four, uh, he put before them another parable. Verse thirty-one, he put before them a parable. Verse thirty-three, he told them another parable. Um, verse thirty-four, Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. That's quite, kind of emphatic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he I, was I, I... The parables. Yeah. <laughs> I also think and then that it continues, our, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven, uh, the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. No, I also think that in terms of our lens, John, I mean, I think that, I think that these parables, these little snippets of parables are surprising. I think they might be a little bit more surprising than what we as 21st century American Christians reading them expect them to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so without getting into it, I'll just, I'll say that. I think that there is a little more uh, for the original hearers that is surprising about these. So, so you are arguing that surprise is an integral element of the parable. The story, the hook of the story is the surprise typically where it goes. Yeah, and I, I would add to what Nicole's pointing out, and again, not trying to get into the text yet, but just the, the juxtaposition parables present is a juxtaposition you wouldn't typically make. Um, and so it, it kind of, like you're using that word hook, the hook is these two seemingly incongruous things are put together. A mustard seed and the kingdom of heaven. Kenny and wisdom. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's part of the power of it. People are surprised at the analogy. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Now to look at the content, and I'm trying to put these things on the table to stimulate your conversation. So it's really just an invitation for you to say what you want to say um, about this and the way the scripture intersects with you in your lives. I think the lectionaries made a mistake in giving us this material that's at the end of it. Clearly, and I, I say that uh, as an invitation to disagree, clearly what we have here are two parables of seeds, the mustard seed and the leaven, right? And two parables of gems. I, 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 as a bread baker, leaven isn't a seed. <laughs> it's we, yeast. Everybody, bread I, they didn't use yeast in the way we use it. Commercial yeast has only been available for a hundred years, not even a hundred years. And so they were using leaven, which was just the naturally occurring yeast in the actual wheat when mixed with water. And it could be a poison. I mean, too, I mean, too, mu too much would, would rot and poison something. Uh, right, because he'll later refer to the leaven of the Pharisees. Right. And John, I believe, is frozen. Um, he looks what frozen. Does 11, what does 11 see? I, I think, John, I think what I heard John try to ask is, what does 11 do? Will? 
So leaven is just the naturally, like, so in wheat, there's naturally occurring yeast, but it doesn't act unless water's added to it over time and you keep feeding it. That's like what a, a sourdough baker calls a starter. And the leaven is what you split off the starter to make a new loaf. So it gets baked into the bread and it acts as a naturally occurring yeast because the commercial yeast wasn't available until I think the early 20th century. Um, and so you, you had to have it from kind of creating it out of wheat. So what, what do seeds and yeast have in common? And that's not a trick question. I'm trying to argue that there are two kinds of parables here in the short parables. One is about gems, treasure, and pearls. And the others are agricultural based is there any commonality for yeast and seeds, or am I just wrong about trying to connect those two? Well, I well, I think, think, oh, go ahead, Nicole. Well, I was going to say that one of the things that I was reminded of, John, as I was reading this morning, is that uh, the, the mustard seed, I mean, going back to last week's text and our not being able to, to determine the wheat from the weeds, uh, the mustard seed the, was considered a weed back in back in Jesus's time, the mustard, it would have been something that would have been pulled up by farmers. It was not something that you wanted in the midst of your crop, um, which I think so often, I mean, at least as I've taught the parable of the mustard seed and even preached on the parable of the mustard seed, I've always approached it from, from the viewpoint and the lens of here is the littlest seed and it can grow into the greatest shrub that ends up, you know, sheltering. Um, birds, which I think is certainly one appropriate lens in which one can interpret the parable, but the way that Matthew places this in the midst of um, the explanation and the parable of the weed and the wheat, I think that this is, this particular parable is an example of why we are not given the responsibility of determining and pulling up the weeds because the mustard seed can do really wonderful and great thing. The small seed that you would pull up because you would presume it to be a weed can grow into the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree and it provides shelter and growth for animals. Um, and I think the same would be true of this uh, sentence about the yeast and the mixing in. Um, you know, yeast, naturally occurring yeast back in the, back in Jesus's day, I think it was utilized, um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that it was even utilized to like help decompose and rot things like bot like bodies, I think. Um, it was part of, I think, like the embalming process, um, if you will, but it also um could give you food poisoning i mean it, leaven was not something that was commonly utilized uh because of the the chemistry of it so you know again here you have yeast which i would then make the the interpretive jump of would be like a weed right it would be something that you would not typically utilize it would be something that you would pull out and throw out and yet in these examples is something that should it be left to flourish can be positive. God can do something with it. I, I, I agree with Nicole in, in reading the commentaries. I think the related element as Nicole was lifting up is that if the mustard seed became part of the wheat that was utilized to turn into bread, it had the ability to contaminate the bread to make it non-usable once the uh, once the the mustard plant seed whatever had become involved in the wheat itself. So I think that's an additional element that that uh, that. I'll tell you one of the things that connects the mustard seed and the leaven with the pearl and the treasure is that they're all the kingdom of heaven. All four of them, you know, start with the kingdom of heaven is like, all right? Now, if that's the case, because I'm trying to decide, I mean, do we preach all four of these parables? 
And I'm not even going towards the net and the fish one at the end, all right? That's a whole different deal in itself. But do we preach all four of these parables together? Or do we preach yeast and seed and pearl and treasure? Um, what hooks them together is the kingdom of heaven. But in what way are they hooked together in continuity uh, between yeast and leaven and pearl and treasure? What's the, what's the link? Uh, if, if there, are these just two completely different aspects of the kingdom of heaven? Small things that grow forth and small things of great value or hidden things of great value. Well, I, I think they can go together with a message that is essentially that each of the parables talk about seeing something in the facts that others may not see. And that relates to issues of faith, I think, that um, uh, allows us to understand out of this or potentially understand out of this that that faith gives us a certain amount of knowledge or gives us a way of looking at things that other people may not have and that's one of the elements of faithfulness that's being lifted up in in the combination <clears throat> you know what I, I go ahead oh, though well i was just going to say i to kind of add to what mike was saying is is the the focus on the the present reality versus the kingdom of heaven and the incongruity between the two and so you see the seed that becomes a giant bush and there's a huge incongruity to the two and yet something connects them right the same with the leaven the leaven is something you add to to create bread and all of a sudden this flat wheat all of a sudden becomes a giant loaf that is risen um and, and, and then you, you switch to the other three parables, which seem to be much more about discipleship and that kind of single-mindedness and focus. Um, but I still think it's the same, right? It's, it's you find something and then you change everything to, to move towards that. And so the, the, the parables are pushing us to see the incongruity between the kingdom of heaven and the present age. And yet there is a connection between them that it's like, it, it's, it's almost like teleological. There's, there's, there's something here in the present and God's pulling it to be something else, not to change it in and of itself, but to become something new, to be transformed. Um, much like uh, in, in Revelation, when uh, in, I think it's the 22nd chapter when it talks about a new heaven and a new earth, the Greek word there, kainon, doesn't mean like a replacement, but rather a transformed, uh, a renewal. And I think that's kind of what these are pushing us towards. All four of them. Yes, but I, I think there's five, isn't there? Well, I, I keep separating out the fish one and the nets. You think that's true of that one too? No, I'm I'm saying the the leaven, the mustard seed, the the field, the treasure in the field, um, the, pearl. the pearl, and then the fish. The the fish. That's what I'm saying. I do you think what you just just said is true of the fish too? Yes. But I'm not using the fish twice. The fish seemed different. What's that, John? The, f the, fish, the fish parable seems different than the other four to me. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can, yeah, they're, they're, I think that you could kind of lump them in together and the fish does kind of stand on its own. But I, I still think it's that, that same process of, affecting some kind of discernment, some kind of change, uh, you know, like discipleship entails these things, whether that's selling everything you have, like the, the rich young ruler, um, or hoping that this small thing can become big, whatever it is, it entails a sense of change or transformation. I think, I think uh, you're right about that. The discernment is a common theme amongst the five, and I see that. And if you push that with the fifth one, orientation or reorientation is a common theme, you know, amongst the five. The, the last one, again, the kingdom of heaven, it has that in common. They, they all are immediately 
contraposition with the kingdom of heaven or in position with the kingdom of heaven. And that, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. It, it's, it segues into the really tough verses that follow about the fiery furnace and judgment. So it's well-placed in terms of it being the segue of the five parables to come up against those verses uh, at the end. Um, but the other four, I think, have a joy element that, that, that isn't in the net and fish one. Now, that's explicitly true about the treasure in the field and the pearl and, and, uh, and imputed by me on leaven. I mean, I think the experience of seeing yeast um, make bread grow is a joyful experience. It, it is a, a fairly, um, always an astonishing experience to me. Uh, and, you know, this, a mustard bush growing up out of a little bitty seed, there, there is something astonishment. So the first two are not explicitly joyful, but I believe in the power of them and productivity of them, there's joyfulness in them. Um, and the next two are explicitly joyful. Uh, and the last one, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about the joy in that, because if you're a fisherman, anytime you throw your net over and you pull it up and it's full of fish, that's a joy moment. Um, you know, if you have enough fish that you have to go through and divide them into good and bad, um, you know, that's, that's a, a pretty big haul. So maybe there's joy implied in that one, too. But it gets so close to the fiery furnace, it burns the joy off for me pretty quickly. <laughs> Well, I think that the fish parable, John, is similar to the to the weed and the wheat parable. I think it's again reinforcing the the message from from last Sunday, um, in terms of who is the one doing the work of the separating, and perhaps that's where we find the joy is that we're we're relieved of that work of the separating uh, because the angels will come out. I mean, Jesus's angels are going to come out and do that work of separating um, and making the judgment and the determination. I'm wondering if you'll help me um, with the parable of the treasure that's hidden in a field and in finding, I mean, I, I see where the text says, then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Um, but I have a hard, I have a hard time with this little parable because it's not his field to begin with, right? I mean, it's, it almost seems a little bit, um, conniving and manipulative. Uh, here he goes, he finds a treasure in a field that I presume is not his because he has to go and buy it. Um, there's no, and then he sort of, you know, he finds this treasure. He doesn't go and tell the landowner that he's found this great treasure. He sells everything in order that he can buy it, which seems a little sneaky to me. Ah, huh. so what is the, that's interesting, the ethical dilemma of the property buyer. Um, but, but I would counter with maybe the other person doesn't see that as a treasure whatever it is, which I think is, I, I, I think that's the beauty of these parables, right? Is they're expansive in their metaphorical capacity. And so you can bring the ethical dimension too, but I think it also can bring up the question, and I don't think one outweighs the other, but um, is, is the treasure something that hasn't been realized by its owner? And is that, um, and then could that be applied to us as well? What treasures do we have that we're not aware of? That helps me, Will. Thank you. In, in what I, I'm a very unethical I, person, so. Mike? Well, I was going to say, and also in terms of value, value is a very confusing element sometimes, too, in terms of what's important to me or what's valuable to me and what's important to you or valuable to you might be dramatically different. Both the farmer, assuming the field person is some kind of agricultural person, the farmer in the field and the pearl man, the, who's a merchant, so both the farmer and the business person are moved by joy. I wrote down the Greek phrase because I, I was engaged with the notion that it's moved, they're changed, 
that there's movement by jo joy. Apotes caros auto. Uh, that, that it isn't just that they had joy, but that the joy was an engine of change in them. And um, neither one, it seems to me, thinks that they're losing something in the selling they do. The joy, the joy enables the selling. I, they don't seem to have a sense of sacrifice uh, here to me, um, but rather they seem to have a sense of great gain, even though they sell everything. The, uh, the person uh, sells all that he has to get the field with the treasure in it, and the merchant uh, sold all that he had. They, they sell everything in order to get the one thing, but they both have joy in that. Um, and I'm wondering economically what that means for Matthew's uh, community and for Christians. It's, it certainly makes me I wonder Matthew, what I would be willing to do that for, right? Or what would, what would the church I mean, what would the church, what would Palmacia Presbyterian Church be willing to give up everything for if it could possess one thing, um, which is part of our, you know, I think part of the exploration of the, of the text. The other thing that I learned this morning in my quick reading of this, of, a, of the Feasting on the Word commentary, is that the, a merchant was not considered... Um, necessarily as a favorable character, <laughs> um, that merchants were considered, uh, this particular commentator said, are the modern day equivalent of like a used car salesman. So sort of someone that you enter into negotiations with short, sort of suspiciously, you expect them to be trying to kind of take advantage of you in, in a way, sell you something for more money than perhaps what it's worth. And so the idea that this merchant um, this would place such value on one pearl to go and sell everything in order to buy it. I think as part of this, going back to that surprise, that juxtaposition, that surprise factor of the parable that, that we might just read over. In neither case are they instructed to sell. In both cases, they seem to sell willingly, the finding itself is the engine and the joy from it that causes them to sell everything. I think that's relevant. I don't know how, but the fact that what they do, that's fairly radical, selling everything they had, is driven not by a moral rigor, but rather by a joy. On a, a connection I'm seeing is um, earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, we say Jesus talking about storing up treasures and treasures in heaven. He says, where your treasure will be there, your heart will be also. And I'm wondering if there's an element in these parables that help consolidate that idea. And if we really find something worth living for, if we find that treasure in the field, that pearl, to get rid of everything else helps us keep our heart on the kingdom of heaven or heart on what we find truly important. That does seem a connection to me, Ken. I, I think that is relevant. The gem, the gem parables, the treasure in the field and the pearl are unique to Matthew. They're not in any of the other gospels. The yeast and seed shared amongst the synoptics, but the gem ones and the joy, which I don't think of Matthew typically as the gospel of joy. Um, uh, you know, um, he certainly is the, He's got these lines about the fiery furnace more frequently than the others. But the, but the gem parables and the joy in them um, are unique to him. And, I, and I'm wondering if this isn't um, a description of a Christian community that's fairly um, motivated um, through good news um, in terms of the way they manage their economics. And maybe, Ken, you know, in, in terms of finding fellowship amongst a common reorientation of their treasure, their heart. And when that has happened, 
that shapes their economics. I mean, the phrase sell everything they had, which is repeated from the rich young ruler story, that's a, a radical phrase. Do you think these, these parables should be pulled together? Um, are they right to give us all five of them or should they be separated? Gems and, and seeds, I am yeast is not a seed. Gems and agricultural stuff and, and, and fish or, or, or are these teaching together? I, I would say they're, they go together because of the kingdom of heaven and, and the, the incongruity between the subjects is to shake us up and make us think, how are all these things pushing us to think better, deeper um, about what the kingdom of heaven is and what it entails? And that Jesus I, is, is lifting up the kingdom of heaven is like some very ordinary, common, mundane, boring things <laughs> like, the, like the mustard seed and leaven and also like some uh, surprising and wonderful and big things like treasure and a pearl. Um, so I think part of that is our, our need, our encouragement to look towards in our own lives, what is the kingdom of heaven like? And, and we, we don't need to just look at the, the big and the grand, but we also need to look in the very common everyday elements that surround us as well. I, I agree with that, but in, in my mind from how I see the parable, I want to carve out the parable of the mustard seed and I want to put it with the reference that's down the road a little bit here in Matthew um, in the 17th chapter where it comes back again and, and the actual language is, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it shall move, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Um, in, in my life, as interesting thing goes, I found a, a, a little framed copy of that verse yesterday while doing some pandemic cleaning, which is a, uh, which is a frame from my mother-in-law when she and Connie Darby and lots of other uh, women of this church, you know, used to meet in their mustard seed class, and it was sort of the center of their faith, this text, and so I want to pull the mustard seed text away and hold it up with the text found later in Matthew, and emphasize the power of the mustard seed, the ability to move mountains kind of message from it, but, but I do see it wrapped with the other parables uh, in terms of the connection to the kingdom of God, and so I guess that's why the, the, the text has written it the way that it has, separating the reference to the mustard seed into two different. Yeah, I could see that, Mike, you know, preaching on the mustard seed with the various references to it. You know, that has attraction for me. But then I like the idea of preaching on the gym. I mean, looking at just at the gym stories. <laughs> but the lectionary scholars are pulling these five together. So let's just look a little at this one at the end before we end. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. And it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. Um, so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that verse, because it's such a uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth is a uh, painful and suffering image and a violent image. Um, but I have to remind myself that if you live in a condition or a neighborhood or a context where injustice and oppression is your regular day-to-day -day experience, then the importance of the kingdom of heaven having justice in it, that the kingdom of heaven does not tolerate evil, that the kingdom of heaven has no place in it for um, evil versus righteous, I can see how that's a fairly important principle, um, how that's a fairly valuable element 
to have as a part of the description of the com community. Those, those of us who um, don't live with the regular suffering part of evil or injustice might be tempted to minimize the importance of having evil removed from the community in ultimate outcomes. Challenge on that, other interpretations, uh, motions to simply leave the net story and the angels of the fiery furnace out of the reading. <laughs> Important, and I'm noticing, so in the section that we're studying this morning, we have that gap between verses 34 and 44. And um, I think we lose out a little bit because in verse 34, Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. And so Matthew is building in this prophetic voice uh, of Jesus. And then even in this, this later passage that talks about the weeping and the gnashing of the teeth, I think that complements that prophetic voice that, that attaches it to the, the greater eschatological realities that Jesus is going to proclaim. And so I just think it has its place in the larger structural narrative. Thank you, Ken. Wow, there's a lot here, isn't there? For parables that are often a verse each, we've been given a big buffet of scripture to carry uh, this Sunday. Final thoughts, friends, things that you didn't get to say that you would say about this text. And then I'm going to ask you, what is it you expect at this point you'll be carrying from the scripture in the pocket next to your heart this week? Um, but before that, are there any final thoughts or observations about the text as a whole that you uh, might want to lift up or say? I just find it amusing that um, we, haven't, we haven't talked about it, but, you know, the text goes, it goes through verse 52, right, Will? I think the lectionary does. And, um, you know, I mean, the last two Sundays, Jesus has told these parables, um, and the disciples come back to Jesus and ask for an explanation of the parables that he has told because they don't understand it. And so then Jesus gives us the explanation for the parables. And then today we're looking at these snippets of parables. And at the end, Jesus says to them, have you understood all this? And they answer, yes which I just want to say, no, you don't. I mean, you don't. I think that it's sort of like living in my, at least in my household, raising young children, you can ask a question and they're going to answer yes. Um, I'd like just their automatic response is yes, because they think that that's what you want to hear or that you're going to move on to something else. If they say yes, when in reality, the answer is very clearly no. <laughs> you know, have you brushed your teeth? You know, as the child sitting there eating ice cream? Yes. Yeah. Well, no, no, you haven't. Have you put on your shoes and socks as they stand by the door barefoot? Yes. No, you haven't. Go put your <laughs> shoes and socks on. <laughs> um, you know, I just, it's, um, it's amusing. I find it amusing, um, this, no. this, this response, um, that they resound and say yes. And I, I wonder what that yes is about. Um, I see that too. Yeah, that it is, it is, it seems to be meant to be a line that is almost comical in yeah. the stance of the disciples saying, please, please, don't give us another parable. Don't teach us about these again. Right, like yeah. we can't, we can't absorb anymore. So like we need you to move on to something yeah. different yeah. now. <laughs> you know, they used to tell the story about Stonewall Jackson as a, who was a professor of military history before, um, uh, you know, his, his role as a Confederate general in the Civil War, um, which is a, a, a terrible role for him to play. But he was apparently a very, um, pedantic lecturer and he would lecture on artillery science and then he would stop and he would ask the students does anyone have a question and if a student asked a question Jackson would look at them and then go back and start again with the first lecture <laughs> and just go through the whole lecture series again until he got to that point and they learned when, at that point he said now, does anyone have a question they learned not to say? <laughs> because 
because they couldn't, they were just afraid of what would come again. <laughs> Do you understand? Yes, we get it now. <laughs> All right. What, what will you be carrying from this text in your heart? Uh, what, what do you think Spirit will be giving you uh, to take with you as you travel with Scripture this week? Anything jump out? I think uh, for me that God can take the small and seemingly useless things and transform them into big, meaningful things. Helpful. Thank you. Anybody else? I I think for me, it's uh, faith can cause or maybe allow us to see things differently than others. Helpful. Thank you. I, I would just add, I, I think these stand as a challenge for us to it, just, just the sheer immensity of a mustard seed to the mustard bush and to realize like that is capable in God. And that is what God is calling us to. And, and to be challenged by the, the, the kind of discipleship call of that. To not settle, I guess. Yeah, and I think to kind of build on what I've heard everyone else say. So for me, the challenge for me is to live into the reality that with God, all things are possible. Helpful. For me, it's going to be the kingdom of heaven is like dot, dot, dot as I encounter the world this week. The kingdom of heaven is like. All right, followers, thank you. Send us your comments, um, your corrections, your challenges, your affirmations. And uh, we hope the Spirit will bring the Scripture close to you this week. Um, somebody's praying us out. Who's doing that? I believe I am. Thank you, Will. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for this day and this opportunity to gather around your word. We pray especially, thank, uh, excuse me, we are especially thankful for parables and the way they challenge us, they stretch our imagination, and they help draw us closer to you and your vision of the kingdom of God. Lord, let us in these days ahead think through these parables and what they are saying to us. Give us a focus and a single-mindedness to seek after your kingdom, to seek after justice and love and mercy, to be challenged by our habits, and instead to be transformed into faithful disciples. Lord, we also lift up at this time prayers for those who are in need, who are ill, who are alone. Surround them with your presence and meet their needs and bring them healing. We also pray for all those on the front line that are continuing to battle against COVID, especially in our home state of Florida, but also across this nation and this world. Bring healing and help as scientists and researchers seek to find a vaccine. We ask all of these things in your son, our savior's name, who taught us to pray. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us give this us day our bread. daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, friends, for sharing with us. This is John Demavoy on behalf of the, all the pastors saying we hope the Spirit walks ahead of you this week and that you're aware of it and that that's an encouragement. And so long from the Sunshine State.